Turn to Proverbs 8 and verse 3. Proverbs 8, 3. Uh, before we get into this verse, I just thought I wanted to mention this. I wanted to commend the Collins family because in my eight years of ministry, I have never had people get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and drive 14 hours to come to Bible study. I mean, that's impressive, i got to tell you. My son Nick would say, who's built different? Yeah, exactly. Yes. All right, Proverbs 8 and verse 3. It says, she crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in, at the doors. Now, the she here is uh, wisdom there in verse 1 that we uh, looked at here just a minute ago. So it says, she crieth at the gates. So here we see that wisdom cries in the place where men congregate, the gates. Now, I will define gate in just a second. Um, To us in our day, the gate probably sounds like a thing you put across the end of the driveway or something. It wouldn't, it wouldn't really carry with it the idea of a place where people congregate, but I will explain what the gates were uh, in Bible times, uh, if you didn't already know. But first of all, let's define cry. She crieth at the gates. Cry is to entreat, beg, beseech, implore in a loud and a moved or excited voice. Some people actually take issue with preachers for preaching in a loud voice when they raise their voice or when they yell. I've had people take issue with me for that, and I don't yell very often, but occasionally I do. And I'm not people in the church, but I've had people make comments that, oh, you shouldn't yell. And blah, blah, blah. Well, tell that to wisdom. Tell it to God, because wisdom cries in the high places and in the gates. A gate is an opening in a wall made for the purpose of entrance and exit and capable of being closed by a movable barrier, the existence of which is usually implied. Said with reference to a city or other enclosure, and that's how it's being used in this verse, or the enclosure wall of a large building, formerly also the building itself, where a door or doors is now commonly employed. In biblical phraseology, after Hebrew, the phrase, uh, for the gates of the city as a place of judicial assembly. And the Bible will bear this out uh, in Bible times, the gates were a place where people would meet to have court, essentially. And I will give you some verses for that in a little bit. I have a quote here from a book that Don gave me. It's called Manners and Customs of the Bible by James M. Freeman. And he was commenting on a passage, I think it was back in Genesis, which talked about the gates. And he says, The gateways of walled cities, as well as the open spaces near them, were popular places to resort, being vaulted and cool, and convenient for the meeting of friends and for a view of strangers, since all who went in or out must pass that way. They often resembled large stone halls and had sufficient area to accommodate large assemblages. There the people assembled at the close of the day to tell the news and to discuss various topics of interest." The gate was the modern-day Facebook, where everybody gets together and chats, basically. And it was also the modern-day courthouse and the modern-day church meeting place, essentially. Um, There was a lot that went on in the gate, as I will show you in a minute. Uh, I I brought a picture here for you. I don't normally do this, but um, when I think of a gate, and when I used to read in the Bible about the gate, I just had this idea of just this fence somewhere with, a, with an opening to it. And then I thought, well, having court there, just, I was like, what, what is this talking about? Um, but when you understand that the, the cities in the Bible were walled cities and these gigantic walls, and they had several entrances, were called the gate, and those entrances uh, were these big fortified areas, like it was a, a large edifice there, um, and that served as a place where people like to meet. Now, this is a horrible picture here. It, it didn't print well, but you can kind of see this. This here is the opening right there. This would be the gate, but this whole thing would be called the gate, and you see these little things right there. Those are people, so that gives you an idea of how big this thing was. Now, if depending on where the sun was, if the sun was over on the other side, this whole area here would be shaded, or if it was back here, the area behind inside the gate would be shaded. So you can see where it would be a great place to meet, especially in the summertime, to get out of the heat. And um, in some of these gates, there were actually uh, 
rooms back inside the wall, pardon me, where people could meet. Uh, so that might give you a little better idea. This is another picture of what a gate would look like. This is the whole wall here, and then here's the entrance, and you can kind of see these little people in here. So it's a, it's a pretty good-sized place, and you can see, once again, it's shaded. be a really nice place to meet and conduct some business, uh, whatever that might be. So crying at the gates would have given wisdom access to the most amount of people at one time because the gates were a bottleneck. Everybody would be going in and out of the city just like, I mean, think about it. Today, if, if you went down to I-35 going into Kansas City in the morning, all the people are traveling on that corridor to come into the city. And same thing in the evening, going the opposite direction. It was like that with foot traffic and donkeys and horses where everybody's bottlenecked right in there. So if you wanted to get a message across... You would stand there and you would have access to all kinds of people. And this is what wisdom does. This implies that God wants wisdom disseminated to all men everywhere. Acts 17 and verse 30. Now, of course, all men aren't going to receive it. All men don't have the capacity to receive it. But nevertheless, wisdom does cry generally and universally. Acts 17 and verse 30. It says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. There was a time prior to the coming of Christ when the gospel was only to the Jews. Right? It was, uh, He showeth his word to Jacob, he giveth his, his law to Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation in Psalm 147. That was a rough paraphrase. There was a time when the, the Jews only had the scripture. And God winked at the ignorance of the Gentiles. He closed, his, he closed his eyes. He didn't, he, just, like, he didn't look at it. But now, with the coming of the New Testament, he commands all men everywhere to repent. The gospel went throughout all the world, not just to the Jews. And then the second part of the verse, back in Proverbs 8, 3, it says, at the entry of the city, at the coming in, at the doors. So she cries at the gate, and she cries at the entry of the city and the coming in at the doors. So we can see from Proverbs 1 and verse 21 that the gate indeed was a crowded place where people assembled as they entered the city. Proverbs 121, this is also speaking of wisdom crying. It says, She cries in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying. Now a concourse is the running or flocking together of people the condition or state of being so gathered together. I always thought this was um, just an interesting play on words here that a good place to preach the gospel would be an airport because it says there that she uh, crieth in the chief place of concourse, right? Concourses in the airport, in the opening of the gates, right? Concourses and gates at the airport. So not a bad place to preach. There's a lot of people there and they have nothing to do but wait for their flight. So if you're ever in the airport and you have an opportunity to strike up a conversation, well, it's probably a good place to do so. Now, the gate of the city was one of the most important places for wisdom to cry due to the activities that took place there. And there were a number of them. Uh, For one thing, the law was often read at the gates. Nehemiah 8, verses 1 through 3. Nehemiah. If I can find it. Nehemiah, what? Nehemiah 8, 1 through 3. This is the chapter where one of our favorite verses is found about how to study the Bible. Remember verse 8, so they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Well, when that what, this is, what that verse is speaking of is what Ezra was doing right here. He was reading them the law at the gate. Uh, verses 1 through 3. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. That was just one of the many gates that entered the city. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. 
before the men and the women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. So he got out and he just read the scripture. They hadn't heard it for a long time. It had been lost. And he read them from morning until evening at the gate. This is a place of congregation. Another thing that was, another, uh, other people that spoke at the gates were the prophets. They prophesied there, such as the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 19 through 20. Jeremiah 17, 19 through 20. It says, Thus said the Lord unto me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, whereby the kings of Judah come in, and by the which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem, and say unto them, Hear ye the word of the Lord, ye kings of Judah, and all Ju- ye kings of Judah, and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem that enter in by these gates. And then he gives them the word of the Lord a good place for a prophet to prophesy because he's going to get the people. He's also going to get the king because the king went in and out there at the gate. And Jeremiah got himself in trouble for prophesying in the gate. And after he prophesied in the gate, the leaders met at the gate of the house of God and tried to kill him. Jeremiah 26, 10 through 11. Jeremiah 26 and verse 10. So Jeremiah just got done prophesying here again. And it says, When the princes of Judah heard these things, then they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord and sat in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people, saying, This man is worthy to die, for he he hath prophesied against this city, as ye have heard with your ears. If there's one thing that makes people mad, it's when you talk about badly about their own country. I know a lot of people probably don't like to hear the bad things that I have to say about our own country. But Jeremiah did it, and they tried to kill him for it, and other men have experienced the ire of their fellow countrymen when they condemn the wickedness in their own nation. Another thing that happens uh, in the gates was court was held there, as I mentioned a minute ago. If you look in Deuteronomy 16 and verse 18... Deuteronomy 16, 18. There's a few examples of this that I'll give. It says, Judges and officers, shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout all throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. So this would be court proceedings where they would hear cases and render judgment. On people, and it would happen at the gates. They apparently didn't have courthouses and city halls and things like that, so it would, took place at the gate. And I really, I would love to live, you know, minus the not having indoor plumbing and electricity and all those things. I would love to live in that day when a criminal committed a crime, and the elders just assembled at the gate. It probably took you know less than a day, and they heard the case, and they rendered judgment. And if the guy was guilty, he was hanged or stoned, and that was it. Just, justice is done, it's over. You didn't wait for months and have all this stuff in death row for years. And It was a much simpler and a much more just society in those days. Another example is in Ruth 4, 9 through 11. Ruth 4, 9 through 11. Ruth is right after the book of Judges and before Samuel. It's sandwiched in there and can be a little hard to find sometimes. You can flip right past it. This is when Boaz was going to buy Ruth, the Moabitess. Her husband had died, and Boaz was not next of kin, so he had to give the opportunity to the next of kin. The next of kin couldn't do it, so Boaz uh, did it. And they had a little uh, legal proceeding here, which happened at the gate. Ruth, nine, uh, Ruth 4, 9 through 11. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have, brought, that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, that was her husband, and, or was that the guy? That might have been the kinsman. 
No, Elimelech was Naomi. Naomi's husband. Yeah, Elimelech was Naomi's husband. And here we go. And all that was Kilion's and Malon's, those were the two sons, I believe, of the hand of Naomi. So he bought it all because uh, all those women lost their husbands. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, I guess is how you pronounce that, have I purchased to be my wife to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place, ye are witnesses this day. So, refers to the gate of his place. I don't know if they were actually in the gate when this was going on, uh, but this is the type of proceeding anyway that would happen at a gate. I'm not really sure now that I look at that if, that's, if they were actually in the gate or he's just referring to the gate of the man's place. Um, oh, okay, all right, I was wondering... Sometimes I, I start to second-guess myself. Uh, verse 11. And all the people that were in the gate, there we go, and the elders said, We are witnesses, and the Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel, and do thou worthily in Ephrata, and be famous in Bethlehem. So thank you for that. Yes, they were meeting in the gate and having this uh, civil uh, proceeding. And then you also have, in 2 Samuel 15, 2, people would come to the gate to have their case heard. And there was a wicked man named Absalom, the son of King David, and he stole the hearts of the men of Israel by standing in the gate and uh, catching the the people as they were coming in and telling them that if, if he were only king, he would make things so much better. 2 Samuel 15 and verse 2. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is is of one of the tribes of Israel. And then um, Absalom goes on to tell him how much better it would be if, if he were king. But this was all happening at the gate where people would go to have their cases heard. And then another thing that was done in the gate was reproof. In Isaiah 29 and verse 21. Isaiah 29, 21. You're probably familiar with this verse. It's a good one to remember. It says, "...that make a man an offender for a word, and lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate, and turn aside the just for a thing of naught." Now, he that reproveth in the gate would likely be a judge, could be a prophet. Remember, because prophets prophesied in the gate, judges render judgment in the gate. And when a, when a criminal has done wrong, the judge is reproving him for his wrong action. Well, people don't like that. And they like to make the man an offender for a word. They like to try to catch the judge in his words. If they can just get him upset and have him speak unadvisedly with his lips like Moses did, they can bring him down. That's what they tried to do to Jesus Christ. You remember, they tried to provoke him, to urge him, to say many things. They just wanted to get him to say one little thing, and then they'd have something to charge him with. So you don't ever want to go there. If somebody rebukes you, don't have it in for them. Don't try to find something that they did wrong. Accept the rebuke. Say, you know, he's right, I'm wrong, it hurts, but he's right, and then thank him for it. Let the righteous smite me. Now, if you see him do something wrong and it's plain and obvious and then he needs rebuke, that's fine. But you don't go digging up evil. It says an ungodly man diggeth up evil. So we don't ever want to do that. Let me give you another example of reproof in the gate. Amos 5 and verse 10. Amos 5, 10. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate. And they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. Reprove not a scorner, lest thou get thyself a blot. Right? People that are scorners hate those that reprove them. And then lastly, gossip was shared in the gate. What better place to gossip than where everybody is mingling around? You really get rumors going if you start them in the gate. They'll spread like wildfire. I used to work with a guy... And I was told that he would start rumors 
just to get them going around the office, just for the fun of it. And then they would circulate their way around the office and make it back to him, and he would hear it and forgot that he started it and then believe it, and then you know, continue to, to spread it. So, anyway, Psalm 69 and verse 12. It says, They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. So it wasn't only judges and prophets that sat in the gate. It was also low lowlifes like this that were speaking against people, telling gossip, singing songs about people, and that kind of thing that they shouldn't be. So the Word of God either facilitates or regulates all of these things. The law being read, prophets prophesying, court being held, reproof given, and gossip shared. It either facilitates or regulates it. So it makes sense that wisdom would be crying at the entry of the city, at the coming in at the doors, at the gate. So men in Israel would have had no excuse for not hearing the wisdom of God because she cried from the mouths of men where they were congregated. Everybody that went into the city went in through the gate. right? So wisdom was crying there to make sure that she had her chance with all of them. So there was no excuse for not hearing it. And there's no excuse today either. Today, wisdom cries in churches, on the radio, on TV, on the internet. It cries everywhere to all men. And everybody has an opportunity to hear it if they'll just listen. Now, of course, there's a lot of garbage that is cried on those uh, mediums as well. But even today, you can still hear truth coming across the radio, coming across the television, on the internet, if you are looking for it and listening. Every time you hear a bit of truth, just remember that. You turn on the radio or the t- I don't even recommend you have a TV, but if you do, 